so this will be recorded. So, um, so first, let me uh, welcome and thank everybody uh, for attending our event today. We're super excited to have you here and uh, participate. I was actually uh, really excited when I looked at the the list of, of attendees and realized we have a lot of people, uh, not only outside of California, but outside of our complete time zone. So I want to welcome those from uh, uh, places such as Scottsdale, Arizona, which is actually same time zone right now, uh, Albuquerque, uh, Houston. We got somebody from Denver. We got Chicago and some of our folks up in Portland. And then even more so, we've got a couple of international team members uh, that are joining us today, one from uh, the UK and then one of us from the Netherlands. So uh, I, I guess for, for those in the inter, in UK and Netherlands, I guess that's more um, not much of a happy hour time, but more of a pub time for you. So hopefully the pubs are open. And you guys are having a great time. So before uh, before I start this off, I, I want to really um, start off by thanking our sponsor, uh, Sonicwall. Um, Philip, uh, I don't know if I've seen you pop on or not, but thank you so much for all of your effort and all your support on getting this event put together. And I want to thank JT for for uh, coming to this event to uh, be one of our one of our presenters. He's always uh, got some great information to present. Um, and then more importantly, or, or I want to actually reach out to Emmy, raise your hand. Uh, Emmy has done an amazing job. Uh, everything you see today between the slides, the uh, the pre-production, the amazing cocktail kits that uh, that you've all received are, are are all of her efforts. It's been a uh, she's been quite busy the last three weeks. So I want to reach out and just thank you so much for all that. And you can have two drinks on me tonight if you, if you want. <laughs> so, uh, thank you. Mom. You're welcome. So a couple of quick housekeeping items. I'm gonna I'm gonna mute everybody right now. Um, just for the purpose of making sure there's no background noise and everybody can hear the presentation clearly. But we do want to make this as interactive as possible. So for those that have not used Teams before, uh, the second button to the right that says show conversations, feel free to click on that. And during any time during the uh, presentation, if you have any question, feel free to write it in there. We'll, we'll definitely get those answered either during uh, or near the end of the of the of the, uh, the presentation. Or if you do if you do want to have ask the question live next to the show conversation, you can click on the the raise hand function. And if we see that, we'll ask you to unmute and you can feel free to ask a question uh, through your through your audio. So we like I said, we want this to be completely as interactive as possible. We want you guys to participate. The panel we have today ha have a lot of knowledge, and so we want you to obviously pick pick their brain. So before before we start, though, um, and give it a few more minutes, I want to I want to turn this back over to Emmy. Uh, for those that have not already polished off the drink, she's going to do a quick little demonstration on how to make uh, make our great little cocktail kit today. Emmy, take it away. You're on mute, of course. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thanks, Paul. <laughs> all, right. all right, thank you. And thank you all for being here today. I'm sure this is probably not your first virtual happy hour and it probably won't be your last, but I'm hoping that these are the coolest cocktail kits that you've gotten so far. Again, Emmy from Enhanced Technologies. I am the self-proclaimed virtual activities coordinator here, among other things. I created the kits and I'm super excited to walk through this with you guys. So what you want to have first, if you haven't opened your kit yet, please do so. If you've already drank it, we don't judge. That's fine too. So I've already opened everything and I have everything kind of prepped so we can get through this quickly and get on to the main event. So what you'll need to have is your own glass, first of all. You will need to have ice and you will also need to have a paper plate so you can empty your sugar packet so we can do a sugar rim. So that's what we're going to start with is a sugared rim and what really helps the sugar stick more than anything else is lemon juice which we've also provided so if you haven't cut your lemons yet please be careful we're not held liable for any accidents just like we're not held liable for any hangovers <laughs> so we'll go ahead with that all right so you want to kind of just squeeze the lemon juice around the rim of your glass and that'll help it stick and then you want to dip the rim of your glass into the sugar. And just kind of coat the whole thing. I think it, it's, it's great for presentation. It makes the cocktail look amazing. Generally, this is done in a martini glass, just so everyone knows. And you'll end up with a sugar rim, like so. 
And then what you'll want to do is you'll want to get your shaker. You'll want to open your shaker out of the box. We provided everyone with a little shaker, which is the perfect size for this cocktail, I think. And you'll want to add some ice. So make sure that you add some ice into your cocktail shaker. Not too much. You really just want to chill it. I'm also going to go ahead and add ice into my glass. I like to add ice to my glass. It depends. Personal preference. So go ahead and pour some in there. And then you can add the ingredients really in whatever way you choose. I like to go with the lemon first. And it's about one ounce of lemon juice which is about one and a half of the cut lemons. So you can go ahead and squeeze that in there. Try not to make a mess. If you do have some paper towels in hand, I recommend it just in case. And again, it's personal preference. You can add more or you can add less. It is completely up to you guys, more sweet or more sour. You know, lemons kind of go everywhere, so be careful. <laughs> And then what you want to do is the, the honey simple syrup is in this container and this is about one and a half ounces and you're going to want to put a half ounce into your cocktail. So I come prepared. I've got a half ounce right here. Pour it into my shaker. And then you'll want to add the gin, which is the most important part. Now the recipe calls for two ounces. This is one and a half ounces. I'm just going to use one and a half. Totally up to you guys again, stronger or less strong personal preference. And for those of you that ordered mocktail kits, now is the time to add your club soda. So you'll dump that in there and then you'll shake. I'm sorry if this is loud, it's metal. Let me get that in there. Make sure you don't make a mess. Be very careful. <laughs> It's like watching the Food Network, isn't it? <laughs> and then you want to take the top off and just go ahead and add to your cocktail. Add to your glass. And I did include garnish as well. You do not have to use the garnish if you don't want. You can cut an additional lemon slice out of the lemons if you'd like something fresh. If not, we have dehydrated lemon slices, which I think look pretty cool. And you can add those to your cocktail and that is about it. That is all that I've got for you guys. If you could take a picture of your cocktail once you're done with it and send it to my email address, which you all should have. It's esiegler at enhancedtech.com. I would love to have photos of these to post online socially when we're done. So that is it. And in that case, cheers guys. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. That was awesome. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> so I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs> so if we're we're going to be taking some poll questions during the uh, presentation. So uh, I asked if everybody could uh, jump in there and uh, throw in a little uh, poll question. We'll have some other more interesting, uh, different ones for you today. But JT, if um, if you want to unmute, I'm going to turn this over to you. You have the unenviable position now of having to follow Emmy. So that's not, now you know why I asked you to go first and not me. So. <laughs> so let me uh, let me reshare my screen real quick, and I will make sure. Well, it, it switched me to computer audio. I think it still will work, but I just want okay. to. Yes, no, maybe so. I think you still sound pretty good. Emmy, how does it sound on your end? Okay. All right, let me pull up uh, the presentation for you real quick. A moment of truth. Yes, there you go. Okay. Uh, the, the the cocktail kit was excellent. I actually uh, made it last night. I couldn't wait. My my wife loved the way that the little uh, bee stirring, honey stirring, whatever that thing's called, came. And she, <laughs> you should open this and make it right now. Like, tomorrow. She's like, do it now. I'm like, all right, whatever. Good. I'm so glad. I might start a business. I'll let That's, everyone know. Yeah, I wish I would have had the directions. You know, that was a much would have been a better experience. Oh yeah. <laughs> Thanks, JT. Of course. Well. Welcome uh, everyone for hopping on the call today. T today we're really just going to hit a, a real high level around uh, what we publish biannually, so twice a year in our SonicWall Cyber Threat Report. For those of you who don't know who SonicWall is, we are a cybersecurity company. We've been in the industry for about 30 years at this point. We have a ton of threat data and we serve small, medium businesses, education, both state and local government, as well as the federal government and Department of Defense and other industry there. So. Uh, certainly have our 
breadth of information and, and just overall data, and we'll share some of that with you today. Go ahead and hit the next one there. Right on. So right now we're looking at uh, just some global trends in cybersecurity over the past year. Some of the biggest stuff that we really bump into is uh, malware and the thought of ransomware. You guys are probably familiar with that. You've probably been hit with it quite a few times. I'm going to mute you guys for two seconds. Totally unprofessional, but this trash truck is right outside and I have to mute it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I love I love these virtual presentations. <laughs> Dogs barking, trash trucks, babies. What else? What else how, we got? How does that happen? Like it's all day. They wait until my happy hour presentation to drive <laughs> this thing right by our house. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> so, anyways, back at the action. So, uh, we're talking about really primarily a huge increase in ransomware and something called crypto jacking. Crypto jacking is the hijacking of your computer infrastructure to mine for things like Bitcoin. And if you're, you know. Current events oriented, you probably know that cryptocurrencies are pretty hot button news items right now. And so anytime those come up and you see a lot of growth in those spaces, people gravitate or malicious actors gravitate to where they can make money. And so crypto jacking is huge. It doesn't really impact your network um, like maliciously, but they are stealing your resources, your power, your accessibility to do something that ultimately probably ends up being nefarious on the back end. So um, some of this stuff goes unnoticed, and the other stuff is ransomware, and that's the one that kind of burns with everyone. I think you've probably heard it 500 times if you've been on webinars like this before, but that's the locking of your data and the prevention of access to your data unless you pay someone an, an amount of money to unlock it. So we've seen a spike in both of those occurrences, but the good news is a relative decline in the number of malware attacks. So what that means is they're getting more sophisticated and more targeted. We can go to the next slide, Paul. So some things that we like to just highlight, um, if you take nothing else away from this, these are some questions you can ask your organization as you're going through and you're reviewing with uh, enhanced technologies and their security arm, as well as just considering your risk profile as a company or as an organization. Some questions you can ask around that might be, Hey, how do we handle ransomware? What does our ransomware plan look like right now? What is our preventative me measures against specifically ransomware? And it's good for an owner, a business, or just a stakeholder to be aware of those. You don't need to know the technical depths, but make sure that the company and the organization you're working with is addressing those at some level. The other one is if you're a company that heavily relies on PDF documents or Microsoft Office documents, especially if those are transported via emails, you need to be especially concerned and critical over those files because that's pretty much the number one way that malicious content is delivered now is uh, is through an office document or a PDF that's malicious, delivered through email into your network. Someone opens it because it's part of their normal day routine and that gets into your network. So uh, be, be extra vigilant on how you guys handle those and just you know have a strategy on what does it look like when we get a uh, unknown attachment. How does that come through to us? How do we control that? And then there's just some some stuff that you can talk about. Again, I talked about crypto jacking. I, what I would say about that sort of topic is follow the news. And as a, as a society, we need to become a little bit better at understanding uh, how attackers move from, from topic to topic. It's primarily current events driven. And I can show that here in a second if uh, Paul bumps the slide one. Perfect. You'll see Last year, we saw a huge spike in malware February and March. A lot of uncertainty right there, right? COVID, working from home, people doing all kinds of different things, a lot of moving parts in our organization. And we had a huge number of fake COVID-related emails and malicious emails. So anytime there's big current events, elections, um, obviously a global pandemic is a pretty good one, but even things like uh, the end of the year, you see some little spikes in November, things like Black Friday deals, uh, just stuff like that. Be, be extra vigilant and uh, be aware that that's what drives a lot of activity. By the way, the United States left it at number one. Uh, we were the number one target for malware last year. UK second in volume. Go ahead. Uh, next slide there, Paul. 
I like to bring this slide up. Last year, California led the way in the number of uh, ransomware attacks. This year, Florida actually. Uh, the, I don't know if that's because they report the most of them, you know, the Florida man joke, or if it's really just around a uh, volume, but you do see a huge exposure point in ransomware uh, attacks across a lot of state, local government organizations. And oftentimes we see that coming through in their contractors. So moving forward, there's a lot of controls that cities and local municipalities are trying to put around and school districts and those types of organizations around how their contracted employees or contracted companies uh, interact with them because they have a large risk profile there. So as you're evaluating how you go to market, uh, consider consider how those you protect those environments. Um, I like to bring this slide back up just because again, it shows across the globe when there's a lot shifting, when we had people moving to a work from home model, when there was a lot of unknowns in IT connectivity, the amount of, of attacks seem to increase. And as people start to round out the year, businesses settle down, you'll see those attacks trail off. And I think a big thing to call out there is um, initially everyone was trying to work from home as rapidly as possible. So a lot of like unsecured connections were being allowed. And as the year went on, companies adopted profiles on how they can control that. And what we're seeing now is the kind of adopted solution they came up with midway through the year is looking to become more long term. So organizations are saying, hey, working from home or hybrid work from home may be something that we do long term into the future of this organization, and we need a permanent solution. So continue to evaluate how you allow remote connectivity, how you allow people to access your critical documents remotely, and make sure, again, if I'm just giving you ammo to ask the question, like how do we handle a remote connected user? What sort of security is on that person? And what sort of uh, controls do I have to make sure they don't send out the ac an accidental document or that they download a malicious document on their home computer that infects my corporate network? So th those are just some questions you can ask. I think I got one more slide after this then there. Perfect. <clears throat> so again, this is a, again, just a snapshot of the ransomware data. What you'll see in this chart is compared to 2019, 2020, we had an increase in incidents, but a reduction in actual variance. And so people are becoming more targeted. They're using known techniques to evade existing security solutions. The industry term for uh, protecting these solutions is something called ATP, like Advanced Persistent Threat or Advanced Threat Protection, ATP. It's the counter to those um, morphing or very, very nefarious ways of trying to evade your existing security. Most security vendors have them. Microsoft has them. SonicWall offers a solution. And many of the products that you, you may have deployed in your networks today offer them. And my suggestion is make sure you're evaluating them and using those tools because we find very often people subscribe to a service. I'm going to pick on Microsoft, but by no means are they are they at fault here, but they subscribe. Someone will subscribe to Office 365, for example, for mail. And there's an assumption there that because you're getting their service, they're also doing security for you. And, and the unfortunate reality is um, not typically by default are they doing that security. So you can pay for them to do the security. You can work with a partner like Enhance to set up additional security layers on that. SonicWall sells layered security. So there's a lot of um, ambiguity there. And the reason I educate people on this is because, again, those office files are your, your number one kind of vector into your network. And if you haven't evaluated them, it's, it's a place that you should really be addressing. I think we can roll to that last slide. And again, I mentioned targeting. If you work or you're engaged in these verticals, these are the people that are highly targeted uh, throughout the year. Government around their budget cycles. So that's like June, July of, of uh, US fiscal. Um, education usually start and end of school years. They get hammered during testing, partially because they're students, partially because there's a lot of activity going on there. And then retail towards the end of the year is a very large target. Tons of transaction data going on, a lot more value in attacking those environments. So think about how the cyclical, cyclical nature of business also affects your security and your risk profile. And, you know, <laughs> tricky, tricky. one more slide. <laughs> yeah, SonicWall has been in the business for 30 years. Um, one of the biggest things we have that differentiates us is something called real-time deep memory inspection. And it allows us to see unknown or what are 
unrecognized security incidents before they take place. We do it through a bunch of fancy buzzwords, but machine learning and artificial intelligence are the, the main two. And we are able to look at data and look at what something's doing before it enters your network to protect you. Now, Enhanced Technology is a fantastic integration partner with us. Most of you that are customers of them are already using this technology and you aren't even probably aware of it. Maybe you are. But um, if you are not a SonicWell customer, you're not an Enhanced Technology customer today, it's certainly something to evaluate in a where area where we can differentiate ourselves. So if there's some interest there or if there's some questions, we'd be happy to take a follow-up call, discuss it, and how it might impact your business and your network directly. Thanks, Paul. Great. Thanks, JT. I'm going to throw up another poll for everybody, if they can take a few moments. Uh, JT, it's always, um, I always learn a lot from these presentations, and I know uh, the technology side, uh, you guys do an amazing job. So if, if everybody can just uh, take a, take a few seconds, fill out the uh, the poll. I'll jump to uh, I'll jump in here real quick before I I turn this over to Jeff. I see you guys are filling this out. Excellent. So I, I kind of want to take what JT's uh, talked about from his you know from the SonicWall perspective, the technology. They're obviously a leader in this space. Uh, they've been a great partner of ours uh, for a number of years. But I want to put this in a little different uh, context for you and, and talk to you about you know, more of a practical aspect of what, what all this means. What is all these stats and all this information and all these, all these bad actors, what they're doing uh, currently. So well, I want to start with talking about disasters. And so one of the things that uh, as, a, as an IT service provider, we work with a lot of our clients and we think about disasters and we plan for disasters. And so one of the things that when people talk about disasters, the first thing that comes to mind is, hey, uh, fire, you know, a fire could cause major problems. It can cause, uh, you know, data loss. It can cause significant downtime. I can tell you in my experience, and I might be older than most people on this call, but uh, I've had one client. Um, we had an alert, and by the time I called them, their their building was on fire. It was actually in Irvine. Uh, by the time I got there, for all intents and purposes, their building was burned to the ground. And so we had to go through the process of doing the the backup and the 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 whole the whole backup and recovery process. One client in you know let's say 30 years. Uh, the other thing that you think about is is floods. And for those that are out of state, yes, we do have rain in Southern California. Uh, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's a huge problem because we're not uh, you know we're not set up that way. Our drainage system's not set up. Our infrastructure's not set up. So when we get a large deluge of rain. Guess what happens? Is it, it we get flooding? Um, uh, we have a vicious cycle every year between the fires and the and the floods and the and the mudslides. So that's another disaster. And I can I can think of a couple of clients where I was walking in their facility and taking my shoes off in ankle deep deep of water. Once again, not very common. Uh, a couple of times in in a thirty year history. Yes, we do get earthquakes. That's probably what we're most famous for. Um, I look back um, and I was thinking about this before this presentation. And I was working, the only time I've ever experienced an outage, uh, data loss and downtime was during the Northridge earthquake, which was in 1992. And I, re and I remember I was working for Carl's Jr. at the time, and they had a regional office in Northridge. And the day after the quake, I had to drive up there to deal with that. It, it, it was catastrophic, don't get me wrong. But once again, that was 1992 was the last time I remember having a, a failure. And then the other disaster to talk about is, is hardware failure. And hardware failure, uh, for all intents and purposes, is far and few between now. With the technology, the level of redundancy, the high availability, and the high quality equipment, don't see a lot of hardware failure. So, so guess what? The leading cause of natural or of any type of disaster that's going to impact your company is not natural disasters, not hardware failures, but really rather human error. Um, ranging from accidental data deletion to the more common humans, you know, human humans falling for something. Uh, if it could be a malware, it could be a phishing scam, but still humans are the leading cause of data destruction. And so the, uh, not to throw any shade on, on, on SonicWall or any, any provider is that the technology is wonderful, but it's never going to be 100% foolproof. Um, and you must take additional measures to protect your company's assets. Uh, from that, and we'll talk more about that uh, throughout this this presentation. So there's been a lot of talk, and I know when these first webinars were started back uh, in April and May, the favorite term was what well, they everybody said the, the term new normal. 
I got so tired of hearing the term about our new normal. I really don't care about our new normal. I really am cared about what our what our future is. Um, and what's become very clear, and there's been a number of stats and polls, um, is that the is that the workforce has been working remotely for for some reason or another, which I can't understand because I don't like to work from home, wants to continue to work from home. Um, and they they feel in some ways they're more productive and they feel that 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 has been a a valuable uh, new addition to their to their new future. Um, and inter interestingly enough, 80% of companies in, in recent surveys said that they're also going to reevaluate uh, their current policies. And probably many people on this call right now are going through the same thing based on your business. You know, are you bringing back, you know, your employees? Are you doing it in a hybrid? Are you staggering it? All those are decisions that you're making um, and they all have value. But the bottom line is in this new future of ours, there's some significant challenges. Uh, from a cybersecurity standpoint, and obviously your remote workforce is vulnerable, without a doubt. Um, right now, cybersecurity has is, is always been important to your organization, but it is even more important as you have staff that are working remotely that aren't being as closely managed. And these amazing collaboration tools, like the one we're using today with Microsoft Teams, are exploitable. And the, the, the scary part is, when, especially when it comes to ransomware, is people need to start rethinking their backup solutions. The traditional backup solution does not fit today's new future, basically. So that's something that uh, is kind of near and dear. So one of the things, um, and, that, and I think JT's slides were absolutely perfect, is seeing the evolution of our cyber threats. The, the rapid pace was evident uh, starting March of last year, increasing through the summer and even to this day that the, the the charts that JT had showed showed a huge spike March to April but it, it stayed consistent throughout the year and as JT mentioned the amount of covid based phishing scams were were rampant back in March and April but for those that remember what followed soon thereafter was all the scams related to stimulus checks and with our federal government issuing stimulus checks electronically through a printed check and even as a gift card, it lent itself to be ripe for um, uh, for scams. Uh, sending somebody an email saying, "Hey, your uh, your stimulus gift card is um, is, uh, is you know is is is, is stuck in, in the system. Please please click on this link and enter your information to get it unstuck." Is very very effective. And then re very recently, we're seeing a lot of phishing scams related to vaccination. Um, with all of the different sites out there, just 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 that I'm aware of, if it's Athena in California, my turn uh, ca.gov. I found like Vaccine Finder, Findashot.org, Vaccines.gov. There's just to name a few. Plus every single major pharmacy uh, in the U.S., such as CVS, Rite Aid, Walgreens, etc., are now offering vaccination. Think of the number of phishing scams they could use, either about your appointment or getting an appointment or it's your turn. And then of course, asking people for critical and sensitive healthcare data uh, is, is extremely uh, concerning. So the, these scammers are really preying on, on the items uh, that are the most concerning to us. This is a much more sophisticated than what we've seen in years past, mainly around Amazon. Uh, maybe your Amazon package has gotten uh, lost and you need to click on this link. Not that that's not effective, but it's not as critical as something like a vaccine. I don't want to do this to you guys, but I am going to talk about ransomware. Uh, JT uh, confirmed it. Uh, I, I received no less than a half a dozen different threat reports, some from SonicWall, uh, some from some other organizations. And, and, and yes, ransomware is still number one, but I do want to expand a little bit um, on the ransomware and say the scary part, because um, ransomware has been around for a very long time and probably everybody on this call is very familiar with ransomware, but it's evolving. And what we're seeing is that that it's no longer your garden variety of ransomware, hoping to get somebody to click on a link or open an attachment, but to literally um, uh, click on something that's not only going to encrypt their data, but now these ransomware uh, culprits are basically uh, exfiltrating your data, pulling your data out of the system, which is something new to ransomware. And what they're doing with that data is if you happen to have a rock solid business continuity platform and you tell them you don't need to pay a ransom, guess what? They're going to extort you and say, hey, if you don't pay the ransom, guess what? We're going to release your data to the wild. We're going to sell your, your information on the dark web 
or we'll do something with your data that's going to damage your company. And then as you hear down uh, later in this presentation, when Jeff is talking about the privacy laws, that release of data could have a significant financial impact uh, along with a goodwill impact on your organization. So that's something to be to take in consideration. The other thing I want to I want to point out is I hear this all the time is, oh, we're a small organization. You know, we're not that big. We're not a, we're not a we're not a, a you know a, a McDonnell Douglas. We're not a government organization. Who's going to come after us for ransom? The bottom line is you are a, you are a, a huge target. What we found in a lot of the stats is the small to mid market is one of the largest targets for ransomware. And and in the, in the days past, ransoms were based on a fixed amount. But now that they're pulling your data, they're able to look at your data and rans and, and set your ransom based on the sensitive nature of data. So I've seen we've we've been brought into some situations where small organizations that have some very valuable data are being asked for ransoms in excess of fifty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars for little for little organizations. So it's 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 very scary. So one of the things that always comes up is, hey, our, our measures, our preventative measures, are they really effective? And everybody I talk to says, oh yeah, yeah, don't worry about us. We've got, I've got antivirus on our system. We've got firewalls. Yeah, we've got, we got it, we got it handled. Our IT department, we got it handled. I hear that way too often. And one of the um, uh, threat reports that we receive is from a, a company called Datto. Uh, this Datto produces, and this slide is from one of their. Uh, one of their one of their uh, cybersecurity state of the cybersecurity reports that comes out annually is literally made up of thousands of companies like ours, uh, companies that basically manage small, mid market, and enterprise clients, and they basically queried every one of them. And if you look at a typical ransomware victim, as you can see from this slide, the majority of them had all of these protective measures. What I don't understand is it shows only 94% of them had antivirus software. That number should be 100%. I don't understand. I don't think I've ever seen a single client that didn't have at least an antivirus on their endpoints, but email filters, um, patching applications, training, all of those items are, are essential, but by themselves, they're not enough. And, and the most important uh, takeaway uh, from, from this, from my portion of the presentation, is organiz organizations really need to have a multi layered approach to their security. Uh, just relying on, on certain technology, if it's antivirus or, 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 or filtering, is just not, not enough. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, ransomware does come in kind of what they call through the front door in some cases. Um, sometimes the ransomware comes in in a very unsophisticated fashion that can bypass. Well, one of the ones that we found and dealt with uh, was a ransomware based on a, a document that was an RTF document, which stands for rich text format. If, if those that follow uh, document, document, uh, it's an international standard um, that could be used to, to basically pass documents from one uh, word processing platform to another. So uh, it's a standard platform. Well, if it comes across, um, and it, in essence, it'll bypass uh, some of the filters, which it did in this case. And when the user clicked on it, it was actually not an RTF document, but a Word document. And when they clicked on it, and if you're familiar with Microsoft Word, it's got a great feature. If a document comes externally to you, it comes up with a banner that says this, this document is protected. I mean, it, 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 there's nothing the document can do. And you actually have to hit the enable button um, to do anything. Well, these, these bad actors were smart enough to put the very first page where detailed instructions on how to do exactly that, how to basically edit or unlock the document. And when this user did that, uh, they unloaded a, a auto start macro or ma basically a word macro that unleashed a ransomware attack. Luckily for this client, we had a multi-layered approach and an additional security service caught the activity, blocked that loot user, and we were able to basically deal with it. But when we looked at that, we were pretty, it was pretty nerve wracking because this was a very unsophisticated yet very sophisticated at the same time that got through a majority of the measures we put in place. So one of the things uh, JT listed on his slides, which I thought was interesting, was a lot of different types of attacks. Well, another attack that we're seeing uh, in our in our side on the rise is what's called a man uh, in the middle attacks. And and the uh, the there's a couple of different variations of this, but the the typical profile that we're seeing is when a bad actor gains access to your email account, um, and unknowns to that user, they'll they'll create 
some 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 rules on the back end, rules that you're not aware of, mainly forwarding rules to send all the emails to an external account. And then these criminals will literally wait patiently for an email transaction that is financial based, typically based on a electronic transfer or a wire transfer. And they will basically intercept that using either what's called a spoofed email. It looks like your email, but it's not. Or what's called a doppelganger, doppelganger type email or account. And what that basically is, they'll they'll go out ahead of time. Like I said, they're very patient, and they'll reserve a domain name that looks very similar to yours. Maybe one letter off, maybe an E instead of an I, or an I instead of an E. And they'll reserve that domain name, and they'll basically take over that conversation. And in some cases, they'll actually delete the email from your inbox. You're not even aware of it, and they'll they'll basically. Uh, send new instructions to the recipient saying, please send funds, you know, to uh, to an alternative account, which is a fraudulent account. And um, I'm not going to put Jeff on the spot, but when he comes on, uh, he, he, he he can probably attest a number of his clients that have probably fallen for this. And we see a lot of different levels of sophistication. And in all cases, some of them are very sophisticated and effective. Some of them are not very sophisticated, yet still effective. So it's so these are these are something to look out for. And since JT uh, was picking on Microsoft, I'll do the same. Um, but realize that um, currently uh, Google Workplace is the most compromised system in the planet, uh, based, just based on their footprint. They're the largest email hosting provider, and uh, and, and number two is Microsoft. But so the real the real uh, motto here is just because your system is hosted with a company, you know, such as Microsoft or Google or, or for anybody for that matter. It does not mean you're secure. There's a lot of steps that need to be taken to do that. So hopefully everybody <laughs> has had your drink, and I'm sorry about painting a kind of a bleak picture, uh, and hopefully that drink is kind of making things a little easy on you. But the bottom line is, you know, the good news is we, you know, we, we do offer uh, and can help a lot of organizations navigate the necessary requirements of the cybersecurity area to help you focus on managing your business. We, we are really here to help you. So what I'll jump really quickly into what I call my infomercial section of my presentation. I just want to introduce our, our company really quickly. Uh, Enhanced Tech is a is an IT and managed service provider. We've been doing this, as you can see, for a long time. I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about our services. Would love to talk to some of you um, uh, potentially after this call or, or next week or whenever it's convenient, but I really want to focus in our cybersecurity services. Uh, for you know, one of the things we realized we've always performed cybersecurity services, but we realized years ago, maybe five years ago, that the critical importance of this was such that we decided to build a dedicated division within our organization, dedicate a security team to provide all the necessary services, both. Um, uh, project-based services and ongoing services to um, allow you to uh, uh, basically put your mind at ease and allow you to focus on managing your business. Why our organization can help you deal with all of the um, uh, issues related to to cybersecurity. So um, I'm going to throw up another quick poll for us really quickly. Hang on a second. All right, let me launch. This poll really quickly. So I'm yeah. offering for everybody on this call, and I hope everybody would take advantage of this. is a is a free service uh, that allows us to uh, do a free rapid cybersecurity assessment, allowing us to um, uh, do some testing on your environment, allow you to see kind of where you stand. If you haven't had a security assessment done um, or haven't had one done in the last year, I highly recommend uh, getting this done. Feel free to uh, to mark this, and we'll reach out to you guys uh, after the fact. And so. Uh, so what I, I'm excited to turn this over to one of my favorite lawyers. I actually have a, in parentheses, insert lawyer joke here. So I'm not going to do that to you, Jeff. I'm not going to say a, 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 a awful lawyer joke. I'm sure you've heard more than your fair share. Uh, but Jeff's going to jump in and give you uh, the state of the ever-increasing and extremely confusing privacy laws that are being enacted basically across across all of our states. So uh with Jeff, if you want to take it from here, and I'll jump you to the next slide. So, uh, thank you, Paul. I uh, appreciate it. I I can tell you that I have heard most of those uh, <laughs> lawyer jokes, and sadly, most of them are well deserved. So, uh, that's a, a completely different conversation that I'm going to need several of these drinks to get through. Um, but you know, for those of you who are on the line, I, I will tell you that I have sat through 
dozens, if not hundreds of webinars over the last 13, 14 months, you may have done the same. I can tell you, you're never going to get in 30 minutes a better overview of the current cybersecurity uh, threats in this country than you just got. Um, you guys, JT, Paul, exceptionally well done. Um, I'm very appreciative of Enhanced Tech and SonicWall for including me. Uh, you know, ME did a fantastic job putting this all together. We appreciate you. Um, I will tell you, uh, again, my name is Jeff Dennis. I am a partner at Newmeyer & Dillian. We are a Newport Beach headquartered uh, law firm, full service firm. We have offices in Walnut Creek and also in Las Vegas. Uh, I, am, uh, I have the honor of leading our privacy and data security practice group. And uh, I, I can tell you, as, as Paul mentioned, um, at least I have at least one, usually many more than one, uh, at least one client who has suffered from each of the cyber attacks that were just discussed. Uh, it is it is that pervasive, and it doesn't matter how big or small you are, where you're located, uh, really even how much uh, money you make, they're coming for you. So uh, I'm going to now pivot and get away from cybersecurity and talk about privacy. And it, I will tell you at the get-go, it's very challenging uh, to speak after a couple of really smart tech guys take the stage, especially after I've had a cocktail, but I'm going to give it a go, and I've got about four hours of information that I'm going to give you in the next 12 minutes. So... Um, Here's my agenda. We're going to take a quick look at uh, privacy laws and, and an overview status, uh, look at the current and coming laws in the state of California, uh, and then I'm going to get out my crystal ball and do the best I can to let you know where I think we're going in 2021 and beyond. Paul, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Hang on. So this slide gives you the, the current state uh, of uh, privacy laws throughout the United States. As you can see from this slide, it is a complete patchwork. There is very little rhyme or reason to, uh, in terms of which states are passing what, and, and uh, it, it's all over the place. Um, these patchwork of laws work in conjunction sometimes with federal laws, such as Graham Leach Bliley, uh, HIPAA, and most of them are, are fashioned in some way, shape, or form after the European Union's GDPR. Uh, which which most everyone has heard about, uh, which provides extensive protection to EU citizens and gives them particular rights with respect to their personal data. Each of these state laws is somewhat akin to that, although they're all different, which makes it a lot of fun uh, for privacy attorneys such as myself. Uh, I will tell you that uh, California, uh, for, those of, for those of us on the left coast, uh, is leading the way in privacy. Uh, we're going to talk uh, about the CCPA and CPRA in just a minute. Uh, Virginia came out of nowhere uh, about a month or so ago and passed their own privacy law. No one saw that coming. It's known as the CDPA. Uh, it gives Virginia residents similar uh, and various privacy rights. And other states, as you can see, are on the horizon. I mean, there's, there's dozens of them. Uh, Oklahoma, we thought, was going to pass one, and theirs just failed uh, in cross-committee. The state of Washington is trying for the third year in a row to pass a privacy law, uh, and it is it's on life support right now. Uh, New York has several laws going, uh, Florida, Texas, Louis, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Um, for those of you who, who may do business in Nevada, I just mentioned that Nevada also has a privacy law on the books, uh, although it has very, very limited uh, rights for Nevada residents. But if you do business there, you need to be aware of it. So the million dollar question that overlays this entire, this entire chart is, what is the federal government doing? Are they going to step in and, legis and provide federal legislation which will basically, you know, make all of the various state, this patchwork, you know, really unnecessary? Um, if you think about it from a practical standpoint, really, we're, we're in a place, the pieces are there to do it. You know, you've got one party controlling both the executive and legislative branches, which generally leads to expedited uh, legislation. There are a whole host of infamous and significant cyber attacks and breaches, which have caught everybody's attention. You know, solar winds comes to mind. Um, you know, we've talked about ransomware time and time and time again. But will it happen? You know, my sense is it, it, it probably will. I just can't tell you when. You know, the federal government's got a few other things that they're dealing with right now. Apparently, this COVID thing is still bothering people, economic recovery, infrastructure. So they've got a lot on their plate. Um, but in all seriousness, there are some serious issues and fights that they're having, uh, and they fall into two categories. One is the enforcement mechanism, and this comes down to who is going to enforce the law. 
are private citizens going to have a private right of action to bring litigation on their own? Or is it going to fall to some government entity? I can tell you in the state of California, we have both, actually, under the, the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. If there is a data breach because you're cyber, because you don't you know, use sound, sonic wall and enhanced technology and you, and you have a breach and personal information is stolen, uh, California residents can bring a private, uh, right, a private claim, private lawsuit against you on their own. They're all going to be class actions. I hate to tell you this, but they can. For privacy violations, however, in California, if you don't uh, provide uh, the right information to consumers, that's controlled. That enforcement mechanism lies with the California Attorney General's office. So who knows what the federal law is going to look like? It's a fight. The other fight is on the issue of preemption, right? Will a uh, federal law preempt tougher state laws? Because if we're being truly honest about this, there is about a 0% chance that the federal government will pass a tougher privacy law than what exists right now in the state of California. It's just not going to happen. They'll never get enough people to agree to it. So what do you do with that? Does it just, does a federal law become, does it preempt state laws that are, that are tougher or does it become a floor? Who knows? This is the conversation that they're having. I can tell you that uh, uh, Becerra, when he was still the Attorney General of California, made it very clear during a recent subcommittee hearing a couple months ago that California would fight any attempt for federal at federal preemption. So who knows where it's going to go? Uh, I can't I can't tell you for sure one way or another. And for those of you who are international, you know, a nod to you as well. You can't forget about privacy regulation outside of the United States. If you conduct any sort of business, you transfer any data from any citizen from another country, you need to be aware that their privacy uh, and cyber laws are going to be different. Uh, and you need to know what they are, because if you don't, you're going to step on the proverbial landmine and we're going to have problems. Okay, Paul, let's go to the next slide. So I want to talk about both the current California law and the coming California law. Um, the sneak peek preview is neither of them are good for businesses. Quite frankly, the CCPA, which you see on the screen now, is the current law. It is the most comprehensive privacy framework in the United States. Uh, it is it is fashioned because after the closely after the GDPR, uh, as I as I said earlier, and it's a response to the fact that we have no federal framework in place. Uh, the goal is to protect uh, California residents' personal information and create transparency in terms of how it's utilized and by whom. Uh, I often get asked by in, in pretty much any any of these conversations, does it apply to me? Well, it depends. There are three threshold requirements for companies to be forced to comply with the CCPA. The first is that you're a for-profit business. The second is that you do business in California, meaning you don't have to actually have a physical presence in the state of California, but if you do business with a single California resident, you are, are considered uh, subject to this. And then you must meet one of three other alternative requirements. One, you have $25 million in annual gross revenue. You collect share or share more than 50,000 pieces of consumer uh, personal information, or you derive 50% or more of your income from the sale of personal information. Um, I will tell you that uh, very quickly, uh, we have seen far fewer enforcement actions from the California Attorney General's office than we anticipated. Uh, but that has been counterbalanced by the massive number of creative plaintiff attorneys and the lawsuits that have been filed. There have been about 50 to 100 uh, lawsuits alleging violations of the CCPA under various theories, bootstrapping with other, uh, other laws like the Unfair Competition Law or the UNRU Act. Um, and you've got some really creative plaintiff attorneys out there who are testing the boundaries of this new law. Uh, and a lot of their attempts will fail. But unfortunately, as they do this, companies still have to pay for a defense. They're still forced to go into court and, and defend themselves. So that's the current state of California law. And uh, we've worked with dozens of clients, a couple of whom are, are on this call right now, to put in CCPA uh, compliance programs for them. Uh, and it's been challenging, but a lot of fun. Unfortunately, we now have to shift. Paul, let's go to the next slide to the California Privacy Rights Act. This is the future of privacy law in California. It was passed uh, as Proposition 24 in the November election. It passed rather easily. And it expands the CCPA requirements. And it is much more in line with the GDPR. Many more obligations on, on companies. Doesn't have an effective date until January 1, 2023. But you need to start uh, concerning yourself with it now. 
Um, Paul, next slide. There are some good portions of the CPRA. I'm not going to go through them, but uh, they're here on the slide and uh, happy to provide these slides uh, to you later. But in the sake, sake of time, I'd like to move to slide six and then the next slide, Paul, please. And then the next one. Let's just do this. So in, in black on this slide, in black you see the consumer rights that are afforded to California residents under the CCPA. In red, you have the expanded consumer rights, which are now coming down on the CPRA. And you, you don't even have to be able to read, just notice colors, and you can see that, that this is a vast expansion. And this is going to be very problematic for, for a lot of companies. Next slide. Um, there is also, importantly, under the CCPA, there's a 30-day right to cure. If you've done something wrong in the privacy uh, world, uh, someone has to give you 30 days to fix it. Under the CPRA, that doesn't exist. So for companies, now the pressure is really on to get it right the first time. Next slide. And there's also CPRA the ugly. And I'm going to talk very briefly about uh, a, a wonderful body that you all hear lots and lots about over the next several years, the California Privacy Protection Agency, uh, which is a, an agency which will have incredibly vast amounts of power and authority with respect to consumer rights in the state of California. They have rulemaking authority. They're taking over enforcement from the California Attorney General's office. And the reason this is ugly for businesses is that you now have an entire agency solely devoted to consumer privacy in the state of California, which I will tell you right now translates to more rules, more regulations, more enforcement. It's coming and it's troubling, frankly. There are also some really challenging uh, pieces to, to fit in the CPRA data minimization requirement, which is very akin to what we see in Europe, uh, and also uh, data retention transparency. So what do you, what do you need to do, in, in short, in the state of California? If you need to comply with the CCPA and you haven't, you needed to start yesterday. Now, you needed to start actually 16 months ago, but start yesterday at least. If you need to comply with the CPRA, it's never too early to get going. Uh, in fact, the, the clients that I'm sure are listening to this right now who I've done CCPA work for are probably saying, great, now Jeff's going to call me tomorrow and talk about the CPRA, and you're right, I will, because this is something that we, we can't wait, uh, wait for because it's going to take a lot of time, especially when it comes to data mapping under some of these uh, retention and minimization requirements. All right, last slide, and then we'll get back to – Well, I like that. We even got some – got How's, the, how's that, huh? A little music. You added that. That was good. <laughs> So I'm not I'm not advanced enough. To, only the tech guys can come up with that stuff. Um, I need that add a little flavor to this. So <laughs> I appreciate it. I need some help. Um, so predictions for 2021. Um, I believe that we are going to see in 2021 uh, between three and five more states passing uh, extensive privacy legislation, which will one make it even more complex to do business uh, in various jurisdictions, and at the same time, will increase pressure on the federal government to do something. Um, I think there's probably about a 50% chance of some type of federal legislation in privacy coming out in 2021. Many, many, many people think that that is way too optimistic. Uh, I was on a call with a guy earlier today who said we wouldn't have anything from the federal government for years, which is scary. Um, and other nations are continuing to advance their own privacy legislation. Uh, China and India have been in the news very, very recently. It's all coming. So what can you do? What do you need to do for privacy compliance in, in terms of best practices? Well, first of all, you need to know your data. You need to know what data you have, what consumer personal information you have, where it is, how it's secured, and how to access it. Because if you don't know those key foundational components, there's no way you're going to be able to take the next few steps, which are, one, I think it's important to purge as much personal information as you possibly can. That if you don't need it, don't keep it because all you're doing is, is by purging it, you're lessening your attack surface and decreasing your potential liability should, should something awful happen. Secondly, protect your data. Look for one of the reasonable cybersecurity frameworks. Work with these guys. There, there are several out there. There's NIST. There's ISO 27001, the CIS 20 controls. Any of these frameworks will help you protect your data. Develop a culture of cybersecurity awareness which assists your privacy program because they run, they, they, they go hand in glove together. Without good cybersecurity, your, your privacy program will, will fail. 
Um, I like to tell people that I'm the, I'm the paranoid cyber attorney uh, in the room at all times. Um, our IT guys, who are actually also on this call, can attest to that. Um, and the, my paranoia drives them nuts. But, but you have to have a borderline paranoia because you've got to be aware of what's going on in your systems. Prepare, finally, prepare detailed workflows of how to handle consumer requests because those uh, can come under the CCPA and the CPRA. Obtain cyber liability insurance. You need a safety net. These, this thing, these things and attacks are evolving so quickly, you need to have a, a, a fail safe in case the worst occurs. And lastly, and I think JT and Paul will, will, will join me in agreeing that if there was a one word you could take from this, it's the word train. Train, 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 and train some more. You need to, your people need to understand how serious this is and the consequences. And that's that's really all I've got. Uh, thank you all for uh, your, my contact information. Any anybody? I know we ran through this very quickly. If anyone has any questions um, that we can't cover in the next three minutes, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, and uh, we'll go from there. And it looks like there's another poll. Another poll. Our last our last poll of the day. So this is a. Uh... So if some of you can uh, fill this out after uh, uh, Jeff's presentation, uh, Jeff, I want to uh, thank you. That was, um, uh, I think, just super. Unfortunately, I've learned more about privacy in the last 10 minutes than I wanted to. I wasn't quite aware of some of the new, the new regulations. So that's a, that's a little bit, um, yeah, it's good good to know, but a little a little disconcerting, obviously. So. Yeah, there's, there's, we, we all have a lot of work to do, and unfortunately, it's, it's not getting any easier. It's not getting any easier on the technical yeah. side. It's certainly not getting any easier on the regulatory compliance side either. So I, I want to – we actually – we came in with um, uh, on time for the most part, which is, a, which is a, uh, an accomplishment in itself. How many of you have been on webinars that have ended on schedule with drinks, with, with drinks I might add? Um, I do want to just uh, kind of close. And, Jeff, I think you, you – you, you, the point you made uh, about the training, I think, is, is paramount. I will leave you with, you know, as our firm does perform a lot of security assessments. And we have two, I call them two types of assessments. We have the, what I call left of boom assessment, meaning the, the, the explosion has not occurred, a proactive assessment. Then we have the right of boom, or the right of explosion assessment. And I can tell you between the cost, complication, we really want to be doing the left of boom assessments for everybody. We don't want to wait to something bad to happen. We, we don't want to see a, an explosion of some sort having to come in after the fact. It's, it's, it is much better for everybody to spend the time, the energy to be organized. If it's around cybersecurity or data privacy, it's better to do it up front. Uh, so with that, I wanted to, once again, thank everybody for attending. Uh, once again, uh, Jeff, thank you so much. JT, wonderful job. Emmy, awesome presentation. I think yours is my my favorite presentation to date. So, <laughs> uh, and then I'll stay on. I'm going to actually make, I've got my kit here. I was smart enough not to drink it ahead of time. So I will, um, I might break this out. I'll stay on the call. If anybody wants to have a, any conversation, that'd be great. If not, um, love to hear from everybody and we'll try to reach out and give you guys some opportunity to, to kind of Absorb what you learned today, and we'll definitely talk next next step. So have have a great day. Thank you so much. So.